Romance of the Three Kingdoms Chapter 14 Chao Chao is brought to defend the emperor but moves him to Xu Chang. Worried by Lu Bu and Xuanda, he tries to set them against each other. The emperor falls for Li Yu's lie that he is backed by the other two rebel chiefs. But Yang Feng does not. There are no others, just Li Yu, he says. Li Yu's bluff is called. Yang Feng can see that the rebel is now of little importance and he sends the champion Su Huan out to challenge him. In a swift encounter Liu is killed, and the White Wave army scatters. The road to the old capital is now clear. So it is that the emperor returns to his former capital of Luoyang. The emperor is horrified by the ruined state of the capital. All the palaces and halls have been burned to the ground. The streets are overgrown with weeds. Brambles smother the ruins. Of the palaces and courts, all that remains are collapsed roofs and crumbling walls. One building is still partially intact, and it is in the small, humble place that the emperor lives. But the court actually meets in the overgrown ruins surrounding it. And there is no food. It is yet another year of famine. Even the few hundred families still in Luoyang have to survive on bark and roots. So bad is it that people just lie down and die beside the ruins of their homes. To secure the safety of the emperor, Yang Biao suggests summoning Chao Chao as he has the strongest army. With the consent of the emperor a messenger is sent to summon Chao Chao to Luoyang. Chao Chao immediately starts to put his affairs in order and prepares to set off on the long march to the capital. Before news of Chao Chao's preparations reach the troubled emperor, rumors spread that Li Zhu and Wu Si are advancing on Luoyang. In despair, the court begins to retreat from the capital. The cavalcade has only just started out of the city gate when Chao Chao's troops appear over the horizon. Joyfully the emperor returns to the palace in Luoyang while in a series of swift maneuvers Chao Chao's army confront and rout the rebels Li Zhu and Wu Si. They flee for refuge into the mountains. Once Chao Chao has settled into quarters in the capital the emperor sends a messenger called Dong Zhao to summon Chao Chao. Chao Chao is impressed by his forthrightness and vigor. For example, he sees that Dong Zhao looks well fed, whereas the others in the city look half starved. How come you look so fit and well? asks Chao Chao. This is simply the fruits of a simple lifestyle, he replies. I've been a soldier for 30 years. You learn a thing or two. It is Dong Zhao who suggests to Chao Chao that the emperor be moved to Xucheng in order that only Chao Chao will be in control squeezing out others such as Yang Feng, who fear Chao Chao. Together they plan how to extract the emperor without upsetting the other commanders. Just say there is more food in Xuchang, advises Dong Zhao. That will placate everyone. The emperor has the plan put to him and, frankly unable to disagree with such a strong man as Chao Chao, he gives his assent. En route to Xuchang, Yang Feng, alarmed at his loss of control over the emperor, tries to stop the procession by placing his army across the pathway. His champion is the mighty Su Huang. However, Chao Chao manages to bring Su Huang to his side. His envoy quietly points out that a hero like Su Huang deserves to serve another hero, not a good-for-nothing like Yang Feng. You know the proverb, the envoy says. The wise bird chooses its own branch, the thoughtful servant chooses his master. Su Huang finds himself agreeing and decides to come over to Chao Chao's side. But when the envoy suggests that Su might kill Yang Feng and bring his head as a goodwill offering, Su refuses, earning the admiration of the envoy. When Yang Feng discovers that his champion has gone, he retreats and takes refuge with Yuan Shu. Once settled in Xuchang, Chao Chao has increasing control over the emperor. But he is troubled by Xuanda and Lu Bu. Xuanda has taken up residence in Shuzhou and has the province in his power, he says, and now Lu Bu has gone to join him and has taken up residence in Xiaopei. My concern is what will we do if they combine in attacking us? It is his advisor Sun Wenrua who comes up with a way forward. He suggests a divide and rule policy or, as the saying goes, two tigers fighting over food. Tell the emperor to promote Xuanda, says Sun Wenrua, to a high official position. But tell him secretly that it is conditional on his killing Lu Bu. If he succeeds, all is well. If he fails, then Lu Bu will kill him. This is my two tigers plot. 
Delighted with this suggestion, Chow Chow arranges for the Emperor's commission to be sent along with the secret orders to Shwanda in Shuzhou. Shwanda receives the envoy and is, of course, pleased to be promoted but troubled by the secret orders. Not so Zhang Fei, who has always hated Lu Bu. When Lu Bu comes to congratulate Shwanda on his promotion, Zhang Fei charges in with a drawn sword and bursts out that Shwanda has orders to kill Lu Bu. Having driven Zhang Fei out of the room, Chuanda reassures Lu Bu that he has no intention of doing as the secret orders have commanded. It is some time later that Guan Yu and Zhang Fei confront Chuanda and demand to know why he would not obey the secret orders. But Chuanda has seen through the plot and explains it to his two friends. While Guan Yu understands, Zhang Fei does not, declaring that he is more than ever ready to kill Lu Bu. When Chao Chao is informed by the envoy that Shuanda has no intention of killing Lu Bu, Sun Wenrua comes up with another saying. The tiger attacks the wolf. Let Yuan Shu know, says Sun Wenrua, that Shuanda has secretly asked permission to attack him and seize his district. This will lead Yuan Shu to attack Shuanda, and then you can officially sanction Shuanda to attack back. Seeing Shuanda and Yuan Shu at each other's throats, Lu Bu will no longer be sure whom to follow or trust. When the envoy brings the second secret message to Shwanda, Mi Zhu's advisor points out that this is yet another trick. I do understand, but, as this is an imperial command, I cannot refuse. As he prepares to follow the orders to attack Yuan Shu he has to decide whom he will leave in charge of Shuzhou. Because Guan Yu is needed by Shwanda for the attack, Zhang Fei volunteers, but Shwanda rounds on him. You, he says. I can't trust Shuzhou to you. You're usually drunk and when you are you attack people. On top of that you always ignore good advice, even when I give it. Do you honestly think I would sleep easy if you were in charge? From now on I'll never drink nor beat anyone, swears Zhang Fei. Xuanda doesn't trust him and leaves his commander Chen Deng in charge with orders to keep an eye on Zhang Fei and his drinking. When the two armies meet, Yuan Shu with 100,000 men and Xuanda with a much smaller army, the clash is brief and goes against Yuan Shu, who has to retreat. Back in Shuzhou all is far from well. Zhang Fei has decided to host a feast, claiming that this is to be his last drinking day. At the feast he insists that everyone accept a toast from him. Coming to the commander Chao Bao, he proposes a toast, but Chao Bao says, I've never drunk alcohol. Mocked by Zhang Fei for not being a proper soldier, Chao Bao is forced to drink. When Zhang Fei comes round again, now very drunk, Chao Bao this time says, No, I won't. Why? demands Zhang Fei. You did last time. But Chao Bao persists in refusing. Zhang Fei flies into a rage. How dare you refuse an order from me? Guards, seize him and give him a hundred lashes. At this point Chen Deng rises and says, this is exactly what Xuanda warned you about. Zhang Fei tells him to mind his own bureaucratic business and at this point Chao Bao begs, please have mercy upon me for the sake of my son-in-law, Lu Bu. Mention of his archenemy only enrages Zhang Fei even more, and he beats Chao Bao 50 times until others at the dinner manage to calm him down. As you can imagine, Chao Bao now truly hates Zhang Fei. This drives him to send a message to Lu Bu, saying that if he attacks Shuzhou now, the city can be taken, because Zhang Fei is drunk. Riding through the night with 500 horsemen, Lu Bu easily takes the city, and Zhang Fei is forced to flee for his life. Most shameful of all is that in doing so he abandons Xuanda's family to their fate. They are rounded up by Lu Bu and locked away. Reaching Xuanda and Guan Yu, Zhang Fei has to tell the awful truth. Where are our sisters-in-law? asks an astonished Guan Yu, referring to the wives of Xuanda. Still in Shuzhou, replies a mortified Zhang Fei. You idiot, says Guan Yu. What did we say to you before we left? What did we caution you about? What on earth are we going to do now with them trapped there? Full of remorse, Zhang Fei draws his sword and is about to cut his own throat. Is this the end for Zhang Fei? Let's find out.